Kimono no Suja Erin. It's basically like Serai no Moribito, but for a younger audience. There are a number of jokes I feel that don't particularly work. There are a lot of fart jokes for one character, for example. And there's some arcs that aren't particularly good. But what's strong about it is the relationship between Erin and her animals. So it's this kind of animal husbandry series plus fantasy politics series. Kind of a mixture of an epic and an intimate sweep. It wasn't fantastic, but I do think it's underrated and largely underwatched. Tale of Genji is a period drama. It kind of covers a good quarter of the original novel, which was written back in the olden days. The story is about a guy who has to come to terms with what royal life has to offer him and what he has to do to find love. It's basically the tale of the very first form of fetishism. He makes his own wife, so to speak. In terms of psychology and as a character study, it's not bad, but it's very, very boring. It is very, very dry, akin to typical period drama aesthetics. It won't do much for any hardcore anime fan now, and it will seem very unanime-like, so watch at your own risk. Basquatch wants to be Gurnlagen really, really hard. It wants to be this kind of badass shonen series with buckets of style, but the plot was really stupid. It wants to also have basketball for some reason to be cool, I guess, and kind of an American influence, but it is a waste of time. The setting, I must point out, is fantastically animated. Yeah, so there's uh, some very good animation. And by the way, there's product placement when it comes to those shoes. Oh god, I forgot that. It was Nike? Wasn't yeah, it yeah, Nike? Nike. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, fun service because they couldn't even focus on a goddamn shoe show about sports, they just had to fuck it all up with random panty shots and boob shots and crap. Patalia went for not so much of a historical fiction, but a historical farce, which in of itself is an acquired taste. If you like uh, Marx Brothers comedies where they just make fun of the status quo, Patalia is very, very, very light. There's not too much bite. It's not gonna like, oh, it messing with my country in such a clever way. There's none of that kind of humor. There is wittiness about it occasionally. You do get some truthful uh, trivia, even though it isn't really used for plot. Speaking of, there is no plot, and the characters go around in circles. They will happily recycle jokes for no other reason. It's a decent time passer, because each episode's five minutes. Okay, on. It's really similar to Neon Genesis Evangelion in it being a stereotype deconstruction where they take the usual Moe stereotype and portray each character with crazy amount of philosophy and we can see a lot of themes uh, revolving around the meaning of life. Then yeah, it's fucking more shit and it's awful. I was, so I was if you're say feeling... that, Ivan, are you high right now? <laughs> no, I'm not. That was sarcasm. <laughs> Uh, and most of your sarcasm will not be in the final product. You should put this in the final product, it's important. Maybe in your mind, but it's my channel, bitch. <laughs> Someone's been watching Breaking Bad. They're eating cake and drink tea, and occasionally playing music. Somehow eating cakes makes you good at playing guitar. Yeah. <laughs> I play guitar myself, and I was kind of like insulted when I saw that the main character would play guitar fairly well in two days without even practicing, because I heard that a lot of girls in Japan started playing music after they've seen K-On, and I think that's really good thing, but for everyone else, everyone who wants to see something that has content in it, besides drinking tea and eating cake, please don't watch this show. It's terrible. Wreck him for the Phantom. One of the rare outings of subtlety for anime. Of course, you would say, hey, Zach, you say mecha story should never be subtle, or zombie story should never be quiet. And yes, to an extent, Phantom does play the subtle card a little too much. It downplays the action, the tension's kind of non-existent, but the uh, atmosphere, the dark colors, the um, character arcs, it's very retro, very 90s movies. If you've ever seen a couple of stories like uh, Nikita or Leon the Professional or stuff like that, it's a wonderful experience if you just have to be prepared for the slow burner effect. Pacing isn't really the best. We have one of the best anime of all times at this point, Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood. It eventually takes the easy way out on its themes, but for Shonen to still not be pretentious with a lot of themes, and for it to keep up the pacing and keep up the, um, the setting expansion, it's a very accomplishing watch. Some people might not like it because it's trying to shoehorn funny things into the more darker tones of the show, but I think it does a really good job this way. Like, Yes, it has its problems. That All of them are due to the fact that it is a Shonen. Oh wow, a video game adaptation, is it good? No. Valkyria Chronicles could be good if they had focused on a war drama, but no, instead of that they just have to make some teenagers with a super tank pinning up armies because, well, they're the main protagonists. And then they have this sort of romance going on and by the end of the day you don't really care about the war, it's just about some half-baked teen drama. Skip the series, play the game. You have some of the best visuals of a sword and sorcery anime you can expect, but the characters are so dry. Gwyn Saga just is further proof that anime cannot make it fun. It's a very retro style Conan the Barbarian story. I can't really recommend it unless you're a fan of 
of old-fashioned stories. The main two characters, it's very hard to care about them because they're constantly clinging to Gwyn, who's amnesiac, and that automatically reduces his character, yet he's got mad skills. And the second half is building up to something that we never get to see. Eden of the East is a classic case of having a nice, understandable, likable idea. It's an extremely dull and a boring show with no tension and extremely uninteresting characters that seem to have some kind of a personality but never go anywhere with anything. Characters are way too fluffy for the setting to be taken seriously. About half of the show is to getting to know characters that we probably won't even be able to see in the second half. It was just really short and it had this easy-go-lucky thing to it and they kind of threw in a lot of like stereotypes to, to make it go like he had amnesia and we don't know why and it couldn't take it seriously because of the tone because it was just too light-hearted. Just too much too soon with two anticlimactic movie sequels. The second Neon Genesis Rebuild movie. The characters open up too much. If in the main series they were closed in to themselves, over here they open up way too fast and because it's a movie format, it doesn't feel that natural to me because of course I'm accustomed to the main series. But you know, the biggest complaint about the second movie is of course, Mari. It just doesn't do anything for the whole franchise at all. Does anyone care about her? Just show of hands. She doesn't do anything in the show. <laughs> She's just there to um, add some glasses fetish. She's I have literally that. just there to sell body pillows. Okay, One more character to sell figurines. It doesn't help and the actual franchise's name. They need less fetish. Chinji is not being a pussy in this show, which is really surprising if you know the original series because Shinji is a pussy the entire time and he does nothing and like he just runs away and cries. I personally stick to the original series more. I like it better. Bakemon Katari. It's basically taking fan service and giving it some fancy dialogues that appear smart but are actually just in service of fan service. So basically this is just one of those dumb fun anime, but it's a dumb fun that was made better than the usual harem. I mean, it's still depraved of any decency, the story is really loose, the characters lose importance after one episode. It's probably the most refined harem clip we have of today. For all intents and purposes, this anime and k are the official ruiners of anime. Bakemon Gatari, I think, is about as good as a harem series could ever be. Because when it comes down to it, the same plot mechanics are very similar to harem series. You have a bunch of girls, who have problems, which are solved by a male lead, and they all fit certain fetish types. So I feel on the one hand, Bakuman Katari is gorgeously animated. It has some pretty good soundtrack choices. It's surprisingly well written, again, by the standards of a harem, but it's still a harem. Good by the standards of what it is, but it's still not great. I just don't think it's the amazing series its fans will say it is. I disagree. <laughs> oh, go ahead then. Because I'm a fan. You're right. It's a harem. It's an achi. It, it did a really well job. I would call it a deconstruction of the genre. It's very aware of its own tropes and stereotypes and deals with it in a comedic way. You know, it's, it's hilarious. They use the stereotypes that existed and they kind of put a twist on it. You know, They played around with it. And I think this is really where the strength is in the show. It tries to take apart the, the stereotypes that we all know from several different harem achi shows. Nothing ever happens in the show. They never do anything in the show. They just talk. There's like slight action sequences in it, but they're mostly talking. And it sounds boring at first when you think about it, but it's not. It's really interesting. The, the writing's really good, you know. It, it keeps you interested in what they say, even if it makes no sense. And they have a lot of references to other shows and other franchises and otaku culture in general and plays on words, which is really witty. And, and the soundtrack is great and the animation is great and it has a lot of cool things. And I overall think it's a really good franchise. Anyone who likes artsy, fun things should watch it. I know PA Works has a lot of fans, but most of the series I've watched of theirs, like, for example, the very popular Angel Beat, I don't care for. On a technical level, their animation is quite good, and Kanan is technically well animated, but it's really badly written. I love this, you know, the girls with guns genre. I'm not someone who demands a lot from it. I just want some women who shoot up other people, and there's some sort of plot that keeps it going. But Kanan has this long, stupid, convoluted plot that makes less sense the more you think about it, and there's characters which are just boring to watch who go on have conversations that I don't care about. Tokyo Magnitude 8.0 the story itself about two kids going home, it never ever feels gritty. I mean, come on, we've walked away from Grave of the Fireflies. It's more of a social critique of what would happen if society had to face a huge disaster more so than any kind of trauma. In its dealing of how Japan would deal with an earthquake like this, basically. It centers everything on kids, which in a lesser series would be just kind of moish. Oh, look at these poor kids who have to be protected. Shock effect. But the two kids are reasonably well characterized, and the story is engaging. And I really liked it. I thought it was pretty good. It's still one no for me. I mean, couldn't they just make a movie out of it? They had to make 11 episodes out of it? It is a bit long. I agree there. It is a bit long. The ending was very, very rushed. Kind of improperly foreshadowed. It's worth watching as just an experience. There's no an other anime that did such an effort to make it so refined. There's no fan service, no gimmicks, no fetishes. A good, clean story, if very dry and straightforward. 
I actually really like Sankarol. It's just a half hour of weird animation and some action violence. It doesn't promise anything more than that, and for a half hour, I'm not expecting anything necessarily by way of coherency. I just want something entertaining. Fluidly animated, it has some really interesting character designs, and it's fun. And now you may trash it. It was the most basic story. The only reason they hyped it, it was because it was from the new creator's project or something. I mean, come on, you're watching basically the pilot episode of a Digimon premise, and then it ends in half an hour. Like, this could have easily turned into a 12 episode series, and they rush everything for 30 minutes. Minutes. It's like a summary, come on! I thought it was boring as well. I just watched for the animation. I have nothing else to contribute. Nothing special if I got everything. Did you have a good time? Now, obviously, you two didn't, but I had a big grin on my face the whole time because I just really liked the back and forth. I don't feel a short has to have narrative coherence. Summer Wars is a ripoff of Digimon with characters that never really develop, a story that stays extremely predictable, is just so bland and generic in every way possible. It had some good character interactions, it had a nice kind of family setting, and it was kind of an entertaining thing going on with the internet plus if you don't love summer wars you don't love family we only know like a handful of people and because of the movie format we don't really get to know them in time we have a virus attack and what does that really mean for family it doesn't mean anything that's the thing with summer wars culturally it doesn't teach us a goddamn thing compared with um pom poco from the 90s where we had a huge tour de force it was boring but you had such a huge cultural understanding of tradition characters making a stand Red line. It's just a glorious spectacle of every cool thing you can imagine. There's no better action movie to watch right now in terms of anime. The animation is amazing. It took them about eight years to make this, I heard. Pure hand-drawn. Just a nostalgia fan's uh, dream come true. It's like a bizarre passion project of its director. This is pure retro fan service for the 70s and whatnot. Of course, there's not really much to say about plot. The plot is really basic. These are the characters, but the setting itself is quite unique in its own way. I'll grant you that the film is probably a little long and it's not that long a movie it's a blast of tempest <laughs> <Done. No. laughs> no. Oh god, the book of Bantora. Oh dear lord. It was pretentious and stupid and mediocre. It took itself really seriously with a really idiotic plot about magic books and book bannings and some other stupid stuff that I only half remember. They kept mm. on throwing in magic fantasies and random plot twists and towards the end it became such a clusterfuck of random things happening one after another. There was no time or focus to just cherish or understand anything so by the end of the day it was fucking nonsense really. Railgun Season 1 It takes the Index universe and focuses on the girls and is written better. It doesn't have the same setup like finds a girl, the girl's a problem, he punches the problem and the problem goes away and he's in the hospital and then the girl likes it. And, and this one is much more like fluid, like this everyday life with some troubles here and there. It's okay, it's really good if you like Slice and Life, it's really good if you like the franchise. If all, you watch it for the characters because you like them. Sacred Blacksmith, I kind of like the premise that it was this kind of fantasy medieval setting, but right from the first episode I knew it would just be this stupid fan service show. Even the sword turns out to be a girl who wears, you know, thin and loose fitting clothing. It had some really terrible English, a ridiculous child character who was an empress, and it had incredibly long speeches by people that I could not care less about. But if you want to get a couple friends over, get really drunk, and watch crap anime, Sacred Blacksmith is a really good choice. Darker Than Black, second season. Horrible. The first season was clean, great action, and the second is basically throwing everything interesting about the first season into the trash bin so they can add a pacifist lolly nobody wanted to see or hear from. Fairy tale. As far as the story goes, they never go anywhere. As far as the characters go, they never go anywhere with uh, their personalities, agendas. Quite generic. It's basically a shonen for babies. I mean, really, there's not much of plot or character development, and everything's about the power of friendship. Bullshit. Shit. Kucha Barranco is an episodic satire of different issues that people deal with casually. They use allegories for animals to help articulate the traits that they go through. It just takes a series of psychedelic images, similar to stuff like Kamonozume, and it just gets this psychological stuff, illustrates their psychological problems through means of surreal animation, and tells a series of stories. It has an engaging main character, and it has an excellent episodic structure, and has very clever use of its diverse animation. You know, not all the episodes were great, but it was generally a very interesting watch. It's all very colorful, the humor is right, placing comedy over critique. If you're asking for an overall plot, you're not going to find it. The TV show came out in December. <laughs> you're not going to find it on the databases, but you must watch this on YouTube, it's amazing.
And now the overall impressions of the year. I think we all three agree that the best series by Full Metal Alchemist is Brotherhood and the best movie was Redline. Uh, yeah, I think that Evangelion was better, but that's just me being an Evangelion fan. That's the thing though with Evangelion is it's mostly just fan service. So taken as an overall effort, I'd probably think that Redline is the better movie for it being just totally made for itself. The, the peak of it being Monogatari, and yeah, it's, I think 2009 had a lot of worse shows, though it had also really good shows. Some good stuff, some really bad stuff. Not a particularly great year overall. Kind of like a dry year, didn't really have like an overall theme, so to speak. We have the bane of anime, and we have one of the greatest animes ever made, so it's kind of like a turning point. 2009, the calm before the storm. <laughs> Do -do -do -doom. <laughs> 22 titles for Autumn, with the worst one being, of course, the second season of Dark and Unblock. The first one wasn't exactly great, but it retained a sense of maturity and seriousness. This one, on the other hand, is bullshit! Trying to explain the story made it look retarded, characters changed personality out of screen, newer ones sucked ass, and the ending is just nonsensical. If you want yet another proof of why sequels suck ass, this is a fine specimen. This sacred blacksmith could have been a decent medieval epic quest with wizards, warriors and blacksmiths. But since it's modern anime we are talking about, it just had to turn to yet another excuse for harem and fan service bullshit! Basquash starts off like an actually good sports anime for a change. I mean, they play basketball with huge robots and in space! But now nah, it quickly proven to be just another mediocrity, full of fan service and product placement for AWESOME SHOES BRAND! Needless pretends to be a parody of Fighting Shonen, but I never saw it as either funny or memorable. The lack of a plot and the weak production values for a madhouse show just make it needless to watch. The second season of Haruhi, or is it a remake? Whatever. Endless 8 was a ridiculous idea and the chronological order of the events proved what a stupid bitch Haruhi was all along and made millions of Haruhists to regret all the offerings they left in her temples. Umineko has that stupid time reset gimmick Higurashi used, but unlike that one it didn't get a complete adaptation, so it's a waste of time to bother with the show. By the way, it wasn't fully adapted because it didn't have killer lollies, thus the otakus didn't care about it, and thus it wasn't profitable to make another season. Or did you honestly think they cared about the murder mysteries or something? And best of all the failures is King of Thorn, a very rushed adaptation of a post-apocalyptic manga. Do you want a movie full of shut around people you won't give a damn dying and a mystery concerning magic science that gets a convoluted explanation? Then watch this movie! Welcome to the fan service section and say hello to Asura Crying, a light novel adaptation which we all know what it's all about. Random superpowers and an unnecessarily complicating plot just to mask a harem. Eleven Eyes, aka I hope Persona Games won't figure out we stole all their ideas. Do you want a soft porn version of Persona Games with a time reset ending? Try this one and then reconsider the public opinion that Persona 4 is a bad show. Sasame Kikoto, lesbian fetish. First season of Heaven's Lost Property, angels fetish. Miracle Train, Bishonen Trains fetish. Second season of Natsu no Arashi, ghost girl fetish. Second season of Nogizaka, Haruka no Himitsu, otaku girlfriend fetish. Second season of Koihime Musu, Romance of the Three Kingdoms with Lolis fetish, Seitokai no Ichizon, School Council Harem fetish, Comfer, Fighting Chicks fetish, Second season of Queen's Blade, More Fighting Chicks fetish, Nyan Koi, Cats fetish. And we reach the top three of the season with the third place belonging to the second season of White Album. It's a generic romance about pop idols and I have nothing to talk about it, but hey, no fun service so automatically better. Second place goes to Aoi Bungaku, an anthology of stories based on classic Japanese literature. Which means they have a million times more quality in writing than your average harems and school romances. And combined with super madhouse visuals, it becomes a very enjoyable watch for people with taste. And finally, Kuchu Buranko, the episodic cases of patients suffering from all sorts of mental problems, and the wacky shrink, who is there to aid them. It may not have much plot, but it's artsy and fun for what it is. Also, it's not an anthology like Aoi Bunkaku, so I place it above it. Summer has 31 completed titles, with the worst one being Shuten Kuro. Aside from the hype the show got for its very slow fun sub releases, it was also made to look like a great prequel to the Romans of the Three Kingdoms. Turns out it was just a poorly conceived supernatural nonsense tale. The coming of age aspect was cool, but why are you throwing in magic in a setting that doesn't need it? Aside from that, it's a boring watch. Zero Seven Ghost pretends to be some mystery adventure about a boy caught between the conflict of religion and the army, while also dealing with the mystery behind some weird ghost. And instead of making use of any of its potential, it wastes all its duration in slice of life and homo lust where nothing is happening. I mean, seriously, 24 episodes where nothing is happening? Unless Fujoshi bait crap counts as plot for some reason. 
Shangri-La pretends to be a post-apocalyptic adventure regarding the conflict between pro-ecology groups and greedy multinational companies. But since it's Gonzo not knowing what the hell they are doing, the whole show is nothing but non-stop scenes of random ideas, goofy action, and of course the obligatory schoolgirl fan service bit. Best part? The setting doesn't even have schools, and yet there she is constantly dressed as one. And seriously, what's all this obsession with Murata anyways? Everybody was hyping this show just for his art style, which is cool but also wasted on terrible Gonzo shows. Modern Magic Made Simple For those of you who think Madoka Magica is an original idea, check out this one. It's the first in a long line of originals. Other than that, it's a complete flop. The directing is terrible, the script is all over the place, the artwork is generic, and by the end of it you just barely have anything important to remember it for. Oh my god, what's up with the epic quest failures this season? We got a dozen of them! Tears to Tiara. Epic quest turns to harem. And not even the fame by the makers of Wate Wararimono, whatever it's called, could save this travesty for being the bullshit it is. Slap up party. Epic quest turns to a boring comedy. Pandora hearts. Epic quest turns to a boring mystery. Valkyria Chronicles. Epic quest turns to slice of life romance. Queen Saga. Epic quest turns to boring politics. Plus it's incomplete. Senko Roll, a whole season worth of plot compressed in just 20 minutes. And some pretend it's actually working. Summer Wars, a stupid Digimon ripoff that pretends to be about family and then throws in a global threat that is resolved by a card game that is based on luck. The romance is retarded, there are way too many useless characters, the ending is a cop-out. It's a bad movie, you testless weeboos! Shin Mazinger Shugeki Z is a tribute to one of the first and most famous giant robot shows. They kept the art style the same, the intro song kicks ass, and the plot has lots of weird concepts in it, in order to flavor an otherwise simple story about a guy in a robot fighting other robots. It should have been something I liked a lot, but wasn't. The pilot episode was the worst possible way to begin it all, basically being a summary that spoils the whole plot in a most confusing way imaginable. You shouldn't do that ever! You also think it ends? Well, too bad, because it doesn't. Also, I didn't like how they tried to make everything even more grimdark than the original. The art style is just too silly to accept it as dramatic or serious, and that contradicts the whole point of trying to make the plot seem dark and mysterious. This is why Mazin Singer SKL, which came out a few years afterwards, is way more entertaining than this one. I appreciate the effort placed in the making, but it just doesn't work as a whole. If there is one thing I love about fan service shows, is that one-liners are more than enough to describe them instead of having to waste time into analyzing them. So off we go. Princess Lover, harem with rich people fetish. Hayata the Combat Butler second season of the first version. Sundere and Butler fetish. Umi Monogatari, mermaid magical girls fetish. Fighty Patsu, Juden Chan, Clubbing Magical Girls Fetish, Kana An, Chicks with Guns Fetish, Sweet Blue Flowers, Lesbian Fetish, First Season of Saki, Cute Girls Playing Cute Mahjong, Kana Memo, Cute Girls Delivering Cute Newspapers, Art Design Class, Cute Girls Drawing Cute Pictures. Ah, oh, the pretentious category, and who else could possibly be in it if not for Uro Butcher and his Requiem for the Phantom? Although I admit it is the best show with assassins, I can also not overlook the endless monologues coming out of these emotionless puppets and the amoral world where stuff happened with no real significance. And for those of you who actually think this is a great and memorable show, can you explain why from all the themes, all the characters, all the events you can find in here, the only thing everybody ever talks about is the final episode? I will tell you why. Because Shock Factor and not following the on. That's the only thing Uro Butcher fucks cared about! And here we are with yet another pretentious fan, by none other than Uro Butcher's buddy Nasu. The Garden of Sinners is the second most pretentious anime ever made, topped only by the second Ghost in the Shell movie. You literally get nothing but people saying fancy stuff that mean nothing. Oh, there is a story alright, there is atmosphere and fancy visuals, and it's all as dull and emotionless as any good pretentious piece of work should be. You can watch it for the directing and for making up shit that explain what they're saying is supposed to mean, but calling it a good psychological supernatural occult mystery? Nah! Ah, oh, another category that doesn't need more than a one-liner to describe its shows. Welcome to the Nothing Ever Happens Slice of Life department. Sora no Money Money, Astronomy Club Slice of Life, Taisho Baseball Girls, Feministic Sports Team Slice of Life, Second Season of Spice and Wolf, A Cute Wolf Girl and a Trader are having cute Slice of Life moments. And nobody cares about the economy stuff! Time of Eve. Short stories about people coexisting with very realistic looking robots. There is a lot of meat in this setting, but they don't really explore it, it never gets really deep or really meaningful. So as much as I would like it to be more meaningful, it sadly is just slice of life with a few science fiction bits in the background. But it's cool for what it is. Third season of Sayonara Zetsupo Sensei. A parody of social norms, and that's all you need to know about it to accept it as a very good comedy. And we reached the top three. Say hello to Redline, that made sports to be actually fun. 
won! This is the absolute racing title with amazing production values and the rule of cool showing the middle finger to common sense without breaking immersion. It's a blast! Second place to the original Bakemono Gatari. I already mentioned the reason in 2013. It's a harem, but it is also a mindfuck and don't like the other shaft titles. It wasn't shafting yet. And the top one is Tokyo Magnitude 8.0. A survival drama about kids trying to get home after a major earthquake. Now, before any of you start screaming about it, SHUT FACTOR! And yet I like it. Let me clarify that I don't like it much. And that the tragedy comes from a natural disaster. No magic aliens or espers, a natural disaster. And it's also a fairly boring watch. I mean, the only thing going for it is the psychology of the characters and even that is not that much. But for a medium that is overflowing with wish fulfillment and overpowered teenagers, this is good stuff for a change. Different, has a point, doesn't overstay its welcome and doesn't make cum buckets out of little children. Not very entertaining but good nonetheless. Title of the season. Meh, once again spring is a boring season with nothing worth it to award. So we will go over the titles in a hurry and cover the rest of the year in the same video. Bottom rank to Chrome Shell Dragos, yet another Attack on Titan type of story and complete shit because it's based on light novels. I mean, they keep saying it's a post-apocalyptic world where they need to defend cities from huge monsters and most of the duration is spent on harem nonsense, terrible English and on top of that it's left incomplete. Second season of Polyphonica, a tale where worlds of magic and science collide, just to offer us some low-budget musical slice of life. Disregard how it's supposed to be about the balance of the universe or something. Kuro Kami is yet another Shana clone, where we get supernatural action just for masking convoluted school romance nonsense. Eden of the East had so much potential to be a great political thriller with high doses of social criticism, as well as a death tournament full of mind games. And it quickly becomes a retarded tale full of magic cell phones, amnesia bullshit, sappy romance and a face palming ending. Cool opening song though. Musashi is about the life of a legendary samurai, but instead of cool samurai action, all you get is a boring documentary. First Squad is about a combo of alien invasion and zombie apocalypse that are supposed to be dealt with in just one hour, so there is absolutely no time to explore a setting full of factions that used to be at war with each other. Asylum Session is a messy premise of artistic liberty and social criticism that are, again, supposed to be dealt with in just one hour, thus there is no time to explore anything. The Girl Who Leapt Through Space is a referential comedy of various space-related shows, and not even a good one at that. First season of Ashura Crying, yet another generic light novel about a school of dork superpowers and a harem. First season of Natsuna no Arashi, Ghost Girl Fetish. First season of Queen's Blade, Fighting Chicks Fetish, Ristorante Paradiso, Reverse Harem with Cooks, Tayu Tama, Harem with Monster Girls Fetish, Candy Boy, Lesbians. First season of Kayon, Cute Girls Playing with Cute Guitars and Drinking Cute Tea. Fifth season of Major, Baseball, Sports. Third season of Hajime no Ippo. Sports. Boxing. And don't give me these excuses about, you know, uh, it's very thrilling, it's full of action and all that stuff. It's still about a sport, okay? Hatsukoi Limited. Slice of Life School Romance, one of the same shit as always. First season of Sengoku Basara. Silly action with samurai warlords. Not very gar, not very wow, but still a nice pastimer. And the best title of this boring season is the second season of Slayer's Revolution. An action comedy regarding a witch with a flat chest blowing up shit because issues. Well, Japan and epic fantasy never went along very well, you know that. It worked as a comedy back in the 90s, but the 90s are way past our age. The humor was too dated and there wasn't much plot to make up for it, so not many cared. And now we can move to winter, where we have lots of better shows to go over, but first we need to suffer through the garbage. Munto is akin to Polyphonica, a get up about worlds colliding, a major catastrophe being about to begin, and the whole presentation is just lazy and closer to slice of life than the apocalyptic epic tale it's supposed to be. You watch lined barrels of iron for some cool robot action? Well, too bad, because it soon turns to done to death harem bullshit. It's modern anime, what did you expect? You think a ride back is a science fiction political thriller about terrorists and military robots? No, dude, it's about a girl piloting a dancing motorcycle while flashing her pantsuit to everybody. And it sucks! Say, how do you stop wars and killings? Why, by making wars and even more killings, while not forgetting to have a power-up every five episodes so you can sell a lot of toys. That is what the second season of Gundam Double O has taught us all. Second season of Corpse Princess. Vengeful spirits turn to zombie girl fun service. Psychic Squad, X-Men turns to k -On. And Japan failing to make a proper epic adventure continues. Tales of the Abyss, epic adventure turns to boring chatting. Second season of Kyo Karamao, epic adventure turns to stupid comedy. Second season of The Tower of Druaga, epic adventure turns to stupid comedy. Again. Some do lost memories. Epic adventure turns to a convoluted mess nobody can understand because bones. 
third season of Hell Girl, occult horror turns to episodic fun service. Gusher and Sins, post-apocalyptic action mystery turns to episodic and confusing force drama. And the ending is terrible. One outs, failed combo of sports and gamble. This is Kaiji done wrong. First season of a certain magical index. Light novel adaptation about a guy punching people and getting chicks to his harem. Clan out after a story. Romance with forced drama and reset ending. And no, it's not the most realistic thing ever imaginable. It's fantasy empowerment. And no matter how good they made it seem, it's still that. And for all of you who think I'm too much of a retro fag who does not appreciate modern shit, if something is retro and sucks, I will still call it bad as it deserves it. For example, Golgo 13. It's just fantasy empowerment about an emotionless assassin being cool and mysterious in an episodic fashion. And he's fucking boring and has no setbacks. We know nothing about him. He's just there killing people. And that's not cool or interesting. And I fucking hate him. Bad show. Titania. Now see, this is a space opera from the same guy who made Legend of the Galactic Hero. I should be head over heels about it, but I'm not, because it's badly animated, boring, and it's left incomplete. So no, see, despite being exactly what I would love, I don't, because it's a bad show. And now make room for the fun service action. Aki-Khan, Soda-Khan Girls, Samurai Harem, the name alone tells you what it is. Fourth season of Maria Watches Over Us, Lesbians. First season of Maria Holic, more lesbians. What's with the name Maria and lesbians anyways? First season of Black Butler, Fujoshi Bait with butlers. And don't pretend there is depth in here because there isn't. Now make more room for a slice of Nothing Ever Happens. Third season of Minami K, slice of life comedy about silly girls doing silly things. Second season of Natsume Yujincho, slice of life fantasy about a guy going around doing silly stuff with spirits. Part 1 of the first season of White Album, Romance about pop idols, Kirari in Revolution, Romance comedy about pop idols, Skip Bit, Romance comedy about pop idols, again, only this time it's actually good, too bad it's incomplete, Tora Dora, Romance comedy about a tsundere schoolgirl voiced by Rie Gugimiya. And don't lose your minds over it, it's just a school comedy, for Pete's sakes, calm the fuck down. Genji Monogatari, slice of life dramatic period drama. Well, at least it's something different. Thank God, no more schools. Make even more room for at least there is action in these titles. Viper's Creed, action about a generic sci-fi military trippy adventure stuff. Forgettable, but hey, it's action, no schools, hey. Michiko and Hachin, slice of life action about a mother and child bonding together. With some cool action bits here and there, but not much plot. They could have done a lot more with it, but they did it. At least there is action. Top 3 of the season with the third place belonging to the first season of Sunred. No plot but well made Power Rangers parody. Second place we have Soul Eater, which on the surface is yet another perpetual ongoing fighting shonen, but on closer inspection it focuses a lot more on the mentality of its characters and has a very catchy art style. Too bad the ending sucks. And the best of the season is the second season of Birdie the Mighty. Unlike the first one which was a generic action flick with an aloof girl, here we get far more focus on the characters and their backdrops, showing us how they tick, as well as how the world around them works. It's simply a far more wonderful overall, which just doesn't feel like silly comedy and trashes its sad moments like Soul Eater does. Too bad I never animated the whole story though. As for the winners of the year, the three seasonal winners are good on their own, but they are no match for the carryover from the next year, which is none other than Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood, the best shonen of all times. Of course, the casuals will most likely choose Clan Adopted Story or Toradora as best of the year, but what do they know? Best movie of the year? Well, there is only one I mentioned as worthy. And it's none other than Redline, one of the best racing action flicks ever made. As for the best OVA, I didn't mention a single one, so the winner is the only carryover for several years now, Helsing Ultimate, which will remain a candidate for many, many years to come. As for notable mentions, we have a few worthy to check out, with Soul Eater being also a candidate for the earlier year. There haven't been any major changes for a while, so this update will cover three years in a row. The only thing I add as a notable mention in 2011 is One Piece, since at that time the Marine Ford battle took place. Yeah, it was slow as hell with crappy animation, but it was also the last good part before everything went to shit because of the time skip. Oh well, it was nice while it lasted. So here are the winners before we move to the previous years.
There are no changes in the winners of 2010, and there was only an addition to the roster. It's a movie called Colorful, which I didn't bother to watch all this time because it seemed to be just a slice of life. But I remember people were calling it amazing back when it came out, so I checked it out. It was a lot more complex than I thought, and yet far more boring than a typical slice of life TV series. It had interesting concepts, all right, from bullying to depression to suicide, and they even tried to make it metaphysical by throwing in spirits in the afterlife. And despite all that, it was so empty of tension, I almost fell asleep twice and I was left with nothing to remember it for. So to hell with it, it's not good for what it's supposed to be. And now the winners before we move to the previous year. Two thousand nine has many changes, and they are all found in autumn. I had awarded Ku Chuburanko as the anime of the season because I found it to be a fun comedy about psychological problems. But a year later, I see it as nothing more than yet another plotless comedy, which has only one good idea repeating in every episode without ever resulting to something specific. So I no longer consider it to be psychological, since it does very little with it, and it's mostly a comedy. Thus, its rank drops from eight to three. It still deserves an audible mention though. What takes its place as the title of the season is Aoi Bungaku, for being a fairly mature anthology of Japanese literature. It is also consisting of short arcs, but each of them lasts longer than an episode and does more with its concepts than Kuchiburanko did. An addition to the autumn roster is Kimono no Shoja airing. I had refused to check it out a year ago because it was for kids and I didn't bother to include those. After receiving a lot of pressure by a guy who kept yelling what a masterpiece it is, I decided to give it a try. On the plus side, for a kiddie show, it has very good atmosphere, very well fleshed out characters and setting, and even includes lots of dark themes like animal misuse and political intrigue. On the negative side, all its good ideas are destroyed by the simple fact it is still a show for little kids. What is the point of having death and bloodshed when you are always keeping it out of screen or mellow it down so it won't scare the kids? There is also so much comic relief that you just don't care when the characters try to take themselves seriously for two minutes every five episodes. Also, the pacing is dreadful. Although there is an ongoing plot, they are stretching it to move as slow as possible. It could have been half as long and it would still be considered slow. Thus, although it is better than a typical kiddie series, it has lots of problems which overshadow the positives. Consider it a slow as hell censored version of a tragic comic of age, and you might enjoy it as a notable time waster. No other changes have been made in the other seasons, so here are the winners for 2009. 